Hi guys, you have made it. We are almost to the very end of part two of the Odyssey. This section is called Odysseus's Revenge. And as promised, it is going to be a violent and bloody scene. But let's backtrack and remember that for 20 long years, all Odysseus wanted to do was to get home from this horrible, horrible nightmare of a life, return to his wife, see his son for the first time since he was born, right? And when he returns to his homeland of Ithaca, where he's supposed to be the king, he encounters dozens of men who are trying to take his wife and also murder his son. So when he sees Telemachus, when he gets to Ithaca, he and Telemachus form a plan of what the revenge is going to be against these suitors. But let's recall that Penelope has been inundated with all of these men saying, you have to get married, you must get married, even her own parents saying that. So she presents a challenge to the suitors and says, if any one of these men can actually string Odysseus's bow and shoot an arrow through 12 ax handle heads through small holes, then I'll marry whoever it is. But she's at a point where she has given up. And when she presents the challenge and all the men are clamoring forth to try to bend the bow and do this, she goes up to her room and she locks herself inside. So she has no idea that the old beggar that stepped forward has met and accomplished this challenge and that as soon as he does all of his disguise wipes away all of Athena's rags and the old man beggar disguise are gone and this is when Odysseus exacts his revenge so let's begin now shrugging off his rags the wiliest fighter of the islands leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out of his at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver, and he spoke to the crowd. Huh, so much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. And he drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous. And just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, the wine was even at his lips. And did he even dream of his death? Psh, no. How could he? In that revelry among his throng of friends, they're all laughing and partying, right? Who could imagine that a single foe, and though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? Oh no, he's much too vain and confident. He doesn't think he's about to die. Odysseus draws back the arrow and out it flies. And it says, Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and it punched all the way through whoosh, to the feathers up through to his throat. Backward and down he went and letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red. And one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and the meat to soak in the dusty blood. Now, as they craned to see their champion where he lay, they are all shocked, right? The suitors jostled in an uproar down the hall. Everyone was on his feet and wildly they turned and they scanned the walls. They are looking for weapons, right? And they could not find any arms, not even a shield. Not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus and they screamed to him, Foul! To shoot a man! That was your last shot! Your own throat is going to be slit for this! Our finest lad is down, they're saying about Antinous. You killed the best on Ithaca! Buzzards will tear your eyes out, they're screaming at him. For they imagined, and they wished, that it was just a wild shot. An unintended killing, right? That, that this guy shooting the arrow just accidentally hit him in the throat. Fools! Not to comprehend that they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, you yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say to of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. And as they all took this in, sickly green 
fear pulled at their entrails, they are beginning to realize who this is and what is happening. And their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or some doorway where they could escape, right? Eurymachus alone could speak and says, he said, if you're Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is, is true. Rash actions, many here, more even in the countryside. But here he lies, the man who caused this all. So he's trying to push all this off on Antinous, but that's not so right. And he says, Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. And he cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronion has denied him as the king of Ithaca. And for that, he tried to trap your son and would have had would have killed him. He's dead now, and he's had his portion, but spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed, so we'll pay you back, is what he's saying. We will pay you back, and, and we will add each one a tithe of 20 oxen. So not only are we going to pay you back for what we took, but 20 more oxen apiece with gifts of bronze and of gold to warm your heart. Oh, please. He says, meanwhile, we can't blame you for your anger. So he's really pleading with Odysseus, hoping Odysseus is going to stay his hand and not kill anyone else. But Odysseus glowered under his black brows and he said, not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all that you enjoy your lands, your flocks, or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be killing until the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house, so fight your way out. Or run for it if you think you'll escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by. And they felt their knees fail and their hearts, but they heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying them. And Eurymachus says, friends, he said, the man is implacable. That means you cannot calm him down. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone, rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out for men to chase him. And this fellow with his bow will shoot no more. And then he drew his own sword as he spoke, a broad sword of fine bronze, honed, it says, like a razor on either edge. And then crying hoarse, like, ah, and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow in that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb stuck in his liver, Ugh! and the bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread and meat were split and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out, he downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. So that was a very gruesome way to die. Amphim Amphinomus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door because Odysseus is standing right in the doorway, just the way that Polyphemus stood in the doorway of his cave, right? And it says, but with a spear throw from behind, Telemachus hit him between the shoulders and the lance head drove clear, clear through his chest. His feet, his left, he left his feet. In other words, he flew and he fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long dark spear planted in Amphimenus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword. At the moment he bent over, so he ran. He ran from the tables to his father's side and he halted panting saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and a spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus and this cowherd. Better to have some equipment. And said Odysseus, run then while I hold them off with arrows as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. So quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where spears and the armor lay. Remember, he had hidden them there. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war, high plumed with flowing manes, and he ran back loaded down to his father's side. 
he was the first to put a helmet on and slide his bare arm in a buckler strap. The servants armed themselves and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. And here is a scene where you can see the fighting and the men on the ground. While he had arrows, he aimed and he shot and he every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all the barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door and armed a four ply shield hard on his shoulder and a crested helm, horse tailed, nodding stormy upon his head. And then he took his tough and bronze shod spears. And this is where we kind of cut out part of the battle and it says, aided by Athena now, Odysseus, Telemachus, Eumaeus, and another faithful herdsman all kill the suitors. They all take, they wipe every one of them out. And Odysseus looked around narrow-eyed, so he's kind of looking at all of these dead, for any others who had lain hidden while death's black fury passed. In blood and dust, he saw that the crowd had all fallen, many and many slain. Here is an epic simile. Guys, we are going to be comparing the dead on the ground who are twitching and dying to fish that you might bring up from a net and you pour them out and they can't breathe, right? And they're flopping around dying. So it says, think of a catch that fishermen haul in to a half moon bay in a fine meshed net from the white caps of the sea. How all are poured out on the sand in throws for the salt sea. So they're all like flopping around, right? Trying to breathe, their mouths moving. Twitching their cold lives away in Helios's fiery air. So, that means this is the comparison. So lay the suitors heaped on one another. So that is a very disgusting end. You're imagining that the suitors are all laying there gasping for breath and maybe the blood coming out of their mouths, gurgling, and they cannot breathe. That is the next to the last section of the Odyssey. That was Odysseus's revenge on the suitors. And now we are going to read the very last section, and it is called Penelope's Test. <laughs> 